been watching Oklahoma Sooner football for a little more than 30 years now. Now, I know what you're thinking. My gosh, you're old. <laughs> well, tell me something I don't already know. But I bring this up because I get so pumped up when Oklahoma plays, okay? When there's that Saturday in the fall, I get excited. When it comes to Oklahoma, Texas, that excitement multiplies, and so do the butterflies in my stomach. It's always one of Oklahoma's biggest games, and this year is no exception. The Sooners and the Longhorns, both teams ranked in the top 15 of the country, and once again, it'll be at the Cotton Bowl in Dallas on Saturday. Before we break down the game itself, um, something that I want to say, speaking of the Cotton Bowl, I know that one day this game is going to get moved, to Cowboy Stadium in Arlington. It's inevitable. Jerry Jones has way too much power, way too much money, and he'll eventually get his way. And with it, the game will go from 92,000 fans at the Cotton Bowl to over 105,000 at Jerry's World in Arlington. You'll have that big, big screen. That's however many feet long it is. It's going to be held in one of the most modern stadiums you're going to see. But... I think I speak for almost every OU fan out there, probably quite a few Texas fans, and a good part of the college football fan base when I say the following. The day that this game moves from the Cotton Bowl to Cowboy Stadium is going to, to me, be one of the saddest days in college football. OU Texas at the Cotton Bowl is one of the few things remaining in college football that is traditional, that is sacred, okay? Money can't buy those things, okay? It can't buy tradition, and it can't buy memories, all right? And too many of them have been made at that stadium, and to me there's nothing like both teams walking down that tunnel just moments before kickoff. And, of course, it's held during the Texas State Fair in Dallas. You move that thing to Arlington, you've already taken that part out of the equation. So I know it's going to happen one day, but I hope for the longest period of time they can keep this thing in Dallas at the Cotton Bowl. Again, it's one of the few things in college football these days is traditional. There's nothing quite like OU Texas in Dallas at the Cotton Bowl. But now that we got that out of the way, let's talk a little bit about the Oklahoma Sooners and that big victory that they had over Texas Tech. Just recapping it a bit. Love the way that they showed balance on offensive side of the ball. That was key throughout the game. And the defense after that sluggish first quarter came with it in the second quarter, and Mike Stoops' D did one heck of a job. And it wasn't just a victory and a big victory, but it creates a lot of momentum, okay? It's that, that, that good feeling that you have, and what a time to have it entering this game against Texas, trying to defeat the Longhorns for the third straight year. And we got our answer as far as the running game goes with Damian Williams. He is the primary back right now. I was happy to see him get 15 touches in the game. Now I expect him to get a lot of touches in this game as well. Talking about the Texas Longhorns, though, in this particular matchup, in terms of where the Longhorns are at right now, um, first of all, they're a better team than what they were last year. In fact, you can kind of take a picture of their 2011 season and 2010 seasons. You can put it in a trash can, take a lot of match, and throw that match in the trash can and watch those pictures burn because this Texas team is better than those last two teams that we've seen at the Cotton Bowl. And offensively, they've surprised me. They've looked better than I thought. I knew the running game was going to be good with Bergeron, with uh, Malcolm Brown, although I know he's been uh, battling injury. And I knew that Jonathan Gray was going to be an impactful player as well. I said it on my uh, Texas pregame show back in August. The passing game, though, is something that has actually surpassed expectations. I think David Ash has developed chemistry with his uh, receivers, with Davis, with Shipley, and with the tight end, DJ Grant. And the year of familiarity with the offense, with Brian Harson, the offensive coordinator, I think the game has slowed down for him, and he looks like a better quarterback. I mean, the proof's in the pudding. Um, third in the NCAA when it comes to passing efficiency. He's only thrown uh, one interception, as a matter of fact, um, so far during the season. So, so far it appears that Ash has done exactly what the coaches have told him to do, and he has been um, improved. Okay, He looks like a better quarterback uh, than what we were expecting. So offensively for Texas, they're averaging a little more than 40 points a game. The ground attack, they're going to run it down your throat or try to. Oklahoma has got to be ready. And the big thing for OU in this particular ball game is, is going to be the play of the linebacking core. Um, Tom Wart, 
Um, you probably heard some some mummering that that um, you know could he be losing his starting position to Frank Shannon? Didn't watch the Texas Tech game. Uh, Wart struggled early from his middle linebacker position. Second quarter, we saw Shannon get into the game. Not only did he make impactful plays, but he also um, led the team in tackles. He had six during the game. How's that for making your mark? And then in the third quarter, when Tech went for it on uh, fourth down, on a, in a pivotal time of the game with OU leading by 11, Shannon came through with the quarterback sack. And that ended up probably uh, being one of the turning points in the ball game, along with that COVID interception uh, previously. So Shannon is really making his mark from the middle linebacker position. Stoop still says that Ward's going to be the starter, but I got to think Frank Shannon is going to play in this ball game. Uh, they're definitely going to need him. So the Texas offense is better defensively. This is another surprise. I thought Texas would be better defensively. Last year, they were number one in the Big 12 in total D, one of the best defenses in the country statistically, but their pass defense so far has been bad. Um, last week against West Virginia, um, they were even double teaming the, uh, the wide receivers for West Virginia, Bailey and Austin, and they were still getting catches. That left only six players to defend the run, and West Virginia's running back ended up having over 200 yards in the ballgame. Um, so, Texas right now, defensively, they're seventh in the Big 12. They've given up a little more than 400 yards per game. Now, I know they've gone against a couple of good offenses lately, but even against Ole Miss in that convincing win, um, Texas still gave up about 31 points in the game and were very vulnerable um, against the pass. So this is going to be one of those games where it's all going to come down to, in my opinion, this is going to be key number one to this game, is going to be um, protecting Landry from the outside. Um Texas still poses that threat to pressure the quarterback. Already Alex Okafor has six sacks this year for Texas. He's going to be All-American. We already know that. But Jackson Jeffcoat, the other defensive end for the Horns, he's gotten better every week. He even uh, last week had a, uh, had a touchdown off a of fumble recovery off of Texas pressure against Geno Smith. So you can say what you want about Texas's um, back seven that they haven't delivered. Um, part of that might be because Jordan Hicks has been hurt the last uh, two or three weeks. He should play this week for the Longhorns, though. They're only returning starting linebacker. But the front four still gets pressure. The other Malcolm Brown, um, a defensive tackle, um, he's into the mix now as far as playing time for Texas. Um, he had a good game last week in spite of the loss. So Texas is still going to supply pressure. They're better up front than Texas Tech was. And I thought, oh, you did a good job last week in protecting Landry. They're going to have to have that same type of protection this week because Texas will be bringing the heat, especially from the outside because of how athletic and quick and strong Okafor and Jeff Coat are. They can give Landry time to throw the ball, watch for not only OU to um, pick apart Texas's secondary, which again has been disappointing, but also they can then go to the ground attack. You can't give Landry protection, then at that point the ground attack's not going to work. Key number two is going to be containing Texas's ground game. It's going to be nearly impossible to stop it. There's simply too good of an offensive line. Texas is too many veterans up front, as well as um, Bergeron, who's been a touchdown maker so far this year for Texas. And we mentioned the improvement of Jonathan Gray. Don't know if the offensive Malcolm Brown is going to play. He's been battling injury. And you have to remember, too, that David Ash does present that element to run the ball as well. So for OU, for that defensive front who's been coming along, I think Jamarcus McFarlane, you know, he, he's, been playing, he's been playing better. Um, we've seen David King, how, how well he's done as well. So these guys up front, as well as the linebacking core, must be able to avoid second and short, third and short as often as possible. You can keep Texas at third and six or longer. Um, that right there makes them a little more one-dimensional, and you will be seeing the Wildcat formation by Texas. Bank on that with um, with a Gray um, orchestrating that. So containing the ground game, remember, I don't know what the streak is, but I, I think it's got to be at least 13 in a row where the winner of this game was also the team that won the rushing battle. So that's a big-time statistic to keep in mind. And again, keep an eye on that middle linebacker position for the Sooners. Key number three, who will get their kicks? Talking about the special teams, and for once, it looks like OU is going to have the advantage as far as place kicking based upon what we've seen in previous games. Right now, Michael Honeycutt comes in on a roll. He's been kicking much more consistently. 
Um, he's done exactly what the coaches have expected him to do. And last week when Oklahoma had a couple of drives stall, he delivered with his foot. And it's not just this year, but the latter half of last season, Michael Honeycutt has looked like a pretty reliable kicker. So it could very well come down to his leg in this game. And conversely for Texas, not really been a strong suit for them. And this is very rare because they've had terrific place kickers in recent years. Anthony Farrah, granted, he's had some growing injury um, a growing injury to deal with, but still the Longhorns, I think, have actually missed more kicks than made entering this game, and they have not made a kick this year beyond 40 yards, and they missed a critical kick in the fourth quarter of that loss last week against West Virginia, which Texas ended up losing that game by three points. Could very well come down to a field goal. And then key four for OU, avoid self-infliction. Entering last week's game against Texas Tech, I had big concerns about the Sooners primarily because of the fact that they weren't forcing the turnovers. At the same time, they were turning the ball over themselves. Well, last week, um, they were able to force a couple of turnovers. In fact, one of those turnovers was a uh, Javon Harris interception that was run back for a touchdown. So the Sooners, even though they're getting better in that in that turnover ratio, they're still in the, near the bottom in college football when it comes to turnover margin. Texas, on the other hand, they're one of the better teams in the country when it comes to turnover margin. And last week was a rare situation where the Longhorns had two takeaways and West Virginia had just one, and yet Texas still lost the game. That rarely happens. I can promise you this. If OU turns it over three or four times in this one and Texas only turns it over once, OU's not going to win this game. So avoid self-infliction and also limit the penalties. Final thoughts on this game. OU fans, please don't expect 55-17 to 17 all over again. Texas' offense is much better this year than last season. It was just one of those things last year where OU, I think, in my opinion, played their best game of the year in that game at the Cotton Bowl in 2011. This year's game looks a lot more even on paper. Um, the, both teams are going to put up a lot of points. I think in the end, though, it's going to come down to a magic kick, and I'm going to say that Michael Honeycutt delivers. I'm going to go 34-31. I don't think OU covers that spread. I think the spread's at three and a half or four. But let's face it, the spread is just for the betters. It's just for Vegas. You win the game on the field, and that's all that's going to matter. I look for OU in a competitive game, and maybe one of the best OU Texas games we've seen in recent years, eke it out at the end against the Horns, 34-31. That's going to be my prediction on this game, OU to win. I will have my post-game show uh, either Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening. Boomer Sooner.